And back to the big story at hand, special coverage continuing today of the Senate impeachment trial of President Donald Trump. Live from Washington, I'm Martha McCallum. And I'm Brett Baer. President Trump's lawyers heading into their final day of opening arguments as administration officials fight off accusations reported in former National Security Advisor John Bolton's yet-to-be-released book. This as Democrats are ramping up pressure on Republicans to force Bolton and others to testify. The Justice Department now denying a report that Attorney General Barr told the former national security advisor he was concerned President Trump was offering favors to autocratic leaders. Yesterday, President Trump denied telling Bolton he withheld aid to Ukraine until they promised investigations, including into his political rival Joe Biden. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer says that's why senators need to hear from Bolton. President Trump and Ambassador Bolton said diametrically opposed things. Only one of them is willing to testify under oath. Who do you believe? <clears throat> when only Bolton is willing to testify under oath and Trump isn't? But some Republicans are stopping short of calling on Bolton to testify. They instead uh, say that they should have access to the unpublished manuscript. That's right. I don't think it's an unrealistic thing for us to say the White House got a copy of it. It's in a classified area because it's not finished with the classification review on it. All of us have classification on it. We should be able to read that and just be able to review it. Senator Jim Langford last night with his proposal that they read it behind closed doors. Fox News is told that today's arguments will go probably two, maybe three hours at the most. They should wrap up well before dinner time. Congressional correspondent Chad Pergram is live on Capitol Hill. Uh, Chad, uh, you know, I know you've been looking very closely at how this looks to break down over the coming days. Explain that to everybody at home. Right, and the big debate will still focus on witnesses right before we came on the air here. Lindsey Graham, the Republican senator from South Carolina, indicated, he said, quote, if you call one witness, it's off to the races. He thinks that there are going to be the votes for a set of four on the Republican side. The whistleblower, uh, Alexandra Chalupa, who is the DNC staffer, uh, Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. But you know, so far, there have only been two Republican senators who have definitively said that they want to call witnesses. And that's Mitt Romney, the Republican senator from Utah, and Susan Collins from Maine. Now, the breakdown in the Senate right now is 53-47. Uh, if they vote to, to call witnesses and that's it, that could be the universe of the two who defect and you still you know, are unable to call witnesses or call witnesses, depending on how that vote goes, which side of the 51 ledger you're on. Here is Mitt Romney. But I'd like to hear from John Bolton, and I think uh, the idea that's been expressed in the media about having each side be able to choose a witness or maybe more than one witness um, on a paired basis um, it has some merit. Democrats like Chris Coons of Delaware don't like the one-to-one -one trade off. They say that's a quid pro quo. Some Republicans, including South Carolina's Lindsey Graham, are pushing for senators to subpoena the manuscript of John Bolton, of course. Perhaps that's a half step. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer opposes the idea. What an absurd proposal. It's a book. There's no need for it to be read in the skiff unless you want to hide something. What, to what extent are some of our Republican colleagues going to twist themselves an entire pretzel to avoid the truth? Now, a lot of times what happens when you get down to one of these tough votes in the Senate where one side wants one thing and the other side wants something else is they cut an agreement or what they do is they make a deal with the devil so that nothing is able to move so that they can at least prevent the other side from getting what they want. And they vote on a slate of, uh, of witnesses or amendments. You see this a lot with firearm votes in the Senate where they assure that nothing will pass. That could be what's in the offing later this week. Again, they won't get to that probably until Friday at the earliest. They will wrap up the defense arguments today about two or three hours and then tomorrow and Thursday they will get into the Q&A section 16 hours of written questions submitted by senators uh, submitted through the chief justice uh, we're told that he probably won't uh, insert himself into this very much it's possible he could rule on a question of relevance about some questions and then they get into that issue later in the week about calling witnesses and documents and remember at the end they just don't vote straight up or down on witnesses and documents they vote if they want to advance to that stage. And if you kill it then, then they could vote, go to a final judgment in this trial. Brett and Martha. You know, Chad, quickly, that we know there's a lot that is fluid in this whole process, but one thing we have nailed down is that I've been told that no dinner has been ordered for the Senate cloakrooms. <laughs> so that, that means they that are is going the biggest, definitively uh, wrap up. Stick. Okay.
wanted to make and, sure. And they didn't restock the candy destiny either. That's the other uh, thing okay. to watch as well. Uh, yeah, things are winding down, at least for this stage of the game. Um, our all-star right. panel is with us once again today. Fox News Sunday anchor Chris Wallace, anchor of the Daily Briefing and co-host of The Five, Dana Perino, co-host of The Five and Fox News political analyst Juan Williams, and former assistant U.S. attorney and former federal prosecutor Andy McCarthy. He is also a Fox News contributor and town hall editor and Fox News contributor Katie Pavlich joining us uh, as well. Welcome back to all of you. Um, you know, I, I think this issue of, of witnesses and what it looks like to each side is going to be an extremely contentious process. Chris, let me bring you in on this. Um, I was listening to Debbie Stabenow of Michigan today saying, you know, unless they think that the witness that's being proposed by the Republican side is relevant to the story, they're going to vote no on that. And it's pretty easy to imagine a stalemate on both sides on that issue. Well, except it doesn't have to be a, an agreement on both. Each witness could be voted on separately. So you could get 51 to vote for John Bolton, and it includes those few Republicans joining with the Democrats. And then you could have uh, none of the Democrats vote, for instance, for Hunter Biden, but then you get all 53 Republicans vote for that. So, you know, it could be that each one is a separate coalition. What has been striking to me in the last 24 hours is the degree to which Republicans, supporters of the president, have really gone after John Bolton. Rudy Giuliani quoted this morning as calling him John the backstabber. Uh, Fred Flights, the former national security advisor when Bolton was in the NSC, his chief of staff saying that Bolton's book should be, his manuscript should be withdrawn. Uh, there's no question that it has done well for the book. I checked again last night. It was now number 17 in bestsellers on Amazon. So uh, all of this publicity has done very well for, uh, for John Bolton. Uh, on the other hand, you know, this isn't just the book because Bolton is on the record for what he has said uh, during the time this was all happening. On July 10th, he said uh, to Fiona Hill, one of his advisors, she testified before the House uh, Intelligence Committee that he didn't want to be part of any drug deal being cooked up by Gordon Sondland and Mick Mulvaney. At another point, he called Giuliani a hand grenade who is going to blow us all up. So, you know, he's on the record as not approving of the deal that was going on here with regard to Ukraine. I have to say, in the end, the big question, I agree with you, witnesses, and what was most interesting today, you know, we've been hearing over and over again about, about Romney and Collins and some of the others, but this morning, you're hearing about Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, a conservative, Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania, a conservative, and they're now entertaining the thought. Maybe we're going to go for witnesses. Right, but it's important to point out the difference there. I mean, one vote is, are you in for witnesses and documents, yes or no? And then the other vote is the specifics of how you move forward. And so far, the tie of one-to-one, -one, Bolton and Hunter Biden, seems like it would be an impasse. Well, but not necessarily. You can't break. It's, it's Mitch McConnell's decision how he packages that vote. It's not Chuck Schumer's. Well, but Chuck Schumer can offer a motion sure. at some point, and he can offer a motion and say, I move that McConnell we hear John Bolton and 51 people. I'm you know, potentially vote for that. And then McConnell can say, well, I vote. We hear from Hunter Biden and 51 people vote for that. So it isn't necessarily a package. Yeah, but if Bolton says, I'll come in and I'll come in and talk. And then the other side says, well, we want Hunter Biden. And Hunter Biden says that he's going to resist that subpoena, that if he comes in, he's not going to speak. Do you listen to John Bolton when you don't have someone on the other side of this one for one deal who is committed and going to answer well, questions? Is, this litigation, I mean, I mean all, all of this, all kinds of just, complex I, I think it's really hard to see at this point how both sides reach an agreement that is going to be satisfactory to both sides. And I think the likelihood that it blows up and neither side, as, as Chad was referring to at the end of his report, they sort of make the deal with the devil and say, we're dug in, we can't move forward. On I mean, there certainly are complexities on both sides. You know, the White House is going to oppose uh, calling Bolton, executive privilege, all kinds of things. And you're right, the Democrats will resist when it comes to Hunter Biden. We're going to toss to a quick break here, but one little item here. Uh, former White House Chief of Staff uh, John Kelly says, if John Bolton says all of that in the book, he was asked about it. He said, quote, I believe John Bolton. That from the former White House Chief of Staff. Uh, we'll head to break right now. And on the other side, we'll start heading into the Senate floor and the final case for the president by their attorneys.
We are back just a few minutes away from the uh, beginning of the impeachment trial in the Senate for today, as we'll hear the next day of the Trump administration's defense. And we want to bring in Dana Perino, who is standing by in New York this morning. Dana, what are you watching for as this gets rolling today? So um, I think that everybody can be a little bit excited that we find that the president's team has said they're only going to use a couple, three hours this afternoon to try to uh, finish this out. And so um, in some ways you think, oh, there must be light at the end of the tunnel. We'll all get back to regular programming. However, as you were just talking about with Chris Wallace, um, this question about witnesses remains. Now, the question about guilt or acquittal is, is still not changed in terms of the calculation of what would the end result be. The only difference is going to be this I, this issue of witnesses and and it'll be interesting to see if the president's team brings that up today i also just from a communication standpoint look at the dichotomy the president lay, rolling out a major middle east peace plan today uh, then he'll have a rally a political rally in new jersey tonight new jersey possibly is that changing the uh, calculations for the president's team as they look at the electoral map especially as you see um, the left really doing quite well in the democratic primaries bernie sanders doing well in iowa new hampshire and so all of these things are happening and while there is a worldwide concern about a flu virus, there's a State of the Union prep, there's just so much else going on, and yet they're all tied up in this, and they'll have a big decision to make on witnesses. Um, Juan Williams, Andy Biggs, a Republican from Arizona, was on our air, uh, asked about the witnesses and going forward on this. Here's what he said. If the Democrats are so hot on this, they could have done something on it. They want to do it now. They, they had 17 witnesses. Republicans had none. They want to make it 18 to 0 going forward because they think Bolton's going to help them. But frankly, I don't know what Bolton's going to say, and I'm not sure that they know what he's going to say. They may not, uh, but obviously they want to hear from him, Juan. I, I think it's really a question about this one for one and how Republicans, how it goes forward. We don't know the logistics as of yet. We really don't, and I don't think we will for some time. Now, obviously, today the president's team will close in terms of their arguments and his defense. And then tomorrow, I guess, we start the phase where you get into the 16 hours of questions being posed by the senators to either team, whoever they choose. And that means Friday is the day that you could potentially have a vote on these witnesses. And as you were discussing, we don't know the exact dynamic. But I will say that it's been a game changer, the Bolton book. And I think that you have, it's intriguing to me, you have senators on the Republican side who are said to have felt blindsided by the fact that the White House had access to this book as early as late December, but they didn't know about it until now. Then you have people who are saying on the Democratic side that they think that the book itself is sufficient uh, in some ways and you may not need uh, Bolton if you say we're going to uh, conclude that Bolton's book and what Bolton said there is his honesty and word and you can take it to the bank. I don't know if that's a possibility. And then finally, of course, you heard reference earlier to the attacks on Bolton and his credibility. Those go on, despite what I just heard from you, uh, Brett, when you said that uh, Mike, uh, that the former chief of staff, uh, General Flynn. John Kelly. Oh, John, John Kelly, Kelly, excuse me, uh, said that he believes Bolton. I, I think lots of people would say that John Bolton uh, is a strong conservative, strong Republican. I don't know that anybody on the Republican side is comfortable with the idea of describing him as a backstabber and, and somehow a tool of the liberal left. Yeah, let's talk about this close and what these attorneys are going to do as we see the Senate floor getting ready for action. Andy McCarthy, you watched yesterday uh, and a, a number of different arguments kind of closing with Alan Dershowitz. What did you make of uh, the White House presentation and, and how, it, how it went and what you think they'll wrap up with today? I, I think you're seeing a shift in emphasis that's actually reacting to this this dynamic about witnesses, Brad. Um, you know, the Dershowitz argument, which, which kind of bookends the Ken Starr argument, makes the case that they don't have ultimate uh, articles of impeachment that pass constitutional muster. In a court of law, if this was a law court instead of a, a really a political exercise, that would be the main issue. You would not get to the question whether you need witnesses or more documentary evidence until you can establish that you actually have articles of impeachment that are worthy of relieving of, of, of uh, removing the president over here because this is a political exercise that legal question is not front and center right really right now what we're talking about is witnesses I expect today if you want to get out of the quandary about witnesses you would hammer the idea that they have not made the case 
on these articles of impeachment, even if Bolton were to come in and testify completely consistent with what we think is in the book or what's been reported yeah. is in the book. Interesting. Uh, Jonathan Turley said that, you know, as devastating as this re revelation from John Bolton was yesterday, because it really did close the gap between what the argument was on the House side. Well, all these people have secondhand information. You don't have anyone who was in the room, essentially. Um, it, it really changed that game dramatically. And I want to bring in Katie Pavlich uh, as we look at this. You know, is that where you see this going today with these attorneys arguing it doesn't matter? What Bolton says doesn't matter. The underlying articles are not strong enough to impeach. Yeah, I think that they'll continue with the argument they've been making for the past uh, two days in the sense that even if the, if the president was asking for certain things, it doesn't rise to the occasion of, re of impeaching him, but certainly removing him from office. But the issue of the witness fight will go on today. And yesterday you saw Pam Bondi representing uh, White House counsel and defending the president kind of issuing a warning shot about where they want to go on Hunter Biden. The Democrats have argued that his testimony would be irrelevant to this process. They made the case that it is relevant for a number of reasons, using media reports about the conflict of interest that Hunter Biden had with Joe Biden, Joe Biden as vice president being in charge of Ukraine. And the White House has made the, the point over and over again that the president was worried about corruption. And Hunter Biden sure looks like he had a problem with corruption, which is what the, the White House team laid out yesterday, and they may do it again today. And they are going to go down fighting when it comes to getting witnesses for the president because they feel like this has been an unfair process from the beginning without getting their side of the story told. Chief Justice John Roberts uh, now gabbling into session and we've missed the prayer in its entirety for a number of days. We're going to hit it this time. Let's listen in. Of safety, protect us in an unsafe world. Guard us from those who smile but plan evil in their hearts. Use our senators to bring peace and unity to our world. May they permit godliness to make them bold as lions. Give them a clearer vision of your desires for our nation. Remind them that they borrow their heartbeats from you each day. Provide them with such humility, hope, and courage that they will do your will. Lord, grant that this impeachment trial will make our nation stronger, wiser, and better. We pray in your strong name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Please be seated. If there is no objection, the Journal of Proceedings of the trial are approved to date. Without objection, so ordered. The Sergeant at Arms will make the proclamation. Good, thank you. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment. While the Senate of the United States is sitting for the trial of the articles of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives, against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. Mr. Chief Justice. The Majority Leader is recognized. We expect several hours uh, of session today with probably one quick break in the middle. Thank you. Pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 483, the Council for the President have 15 hours and 33 minutes remaining to make the presentation of their case though it will not be possible to use the remainder of that time before the end of the day. The Senate will now hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. Just to give you a very quick, brief overview of today, 
We do not intend to use much of that time today, Mr. Chief Justice. We intend to be, our goal is to be finished by dinner time and well before. We'll have three presentations. First will be Pat Philbin, Deputy White House Counsel. Then Jay Sekulow will give a presentation. We'll take a break if that's okay with you, Mr. Leader, and then after that, I'll finish with a presentation. So that's our, our goal for the day. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pat Philbin. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, Majority Leader McConnell, Minority Leader Schumer, I'd like to start today by making a couple of observations related to the abuse of power charge in the first article of impeachment. And I, I wouldn't presume to elaborate on Professor Dershowitz's presentation from yesterday evening, which I thought was complete and compelling, but I wanted to just add a couple of very specific points in support of the exposition of the Constitution and the impeachment clause that he set out. And it begins from a focus on the point in the debate about the impeachment clause at the Constitutional Convention where maladministration was offered by George Mason as a grounds for impeachment. And James Madison responded that that was a bad idea. And he said, so vague a term will be equivalent to a tenure during the pleasure of the Senate. And that evinced a deep-seated concern that Madison had, and it's part of the whole design of our Constitution, for ways that can lead to exercises of arbitrary power. The Constitution was designed to put limits and checks on all forms of government power. Obviously, one of the great mechanisms for that is the separation of powers, the structural separation of powers in our Constitution. But it also comes from defining and limiting powers and responsibilities and a concern that vague terms, vague standards are themselves an opportunity for the expansion of power and the exercise of arbitrary power. And we see that throughout the Constitution and in the impeachment clause as well. And this is why, as Governor Morris argued in discussing the impeachment clause, that only few offenses, he said few offenses, ought to be impeachable and the cases ought to be enumerated and defined. And that's why we see in the debates at the Constitution, there was a, many terms had been included in earlier drafts when it was narrowed down to treason and bribery, and there was a suggestion to include maladministration, which had been a ground for impeachment in English practice. The framers rejected it because it was too vague. It was too expansive. It would allow for arbitrary exercises of power. And we see throughout the Constitution in terms that relate and fit in with the impeachment clause the same concern. One is in the definition of treason. The framers were very concerned that the English practice of having a vague concept of treason that was malleable and could be changed even after the fact to define new concepts of treason was dangerous. It was one of the things that they wanted to reject from the English system. So they defined in the Constitution very specifically what constituted treason and how it had to be proved. And then that term was incorporated into the impeachment clause. Similarly, in the rejection of maladministration, which had been an impeachable offense in England, the framers rejected that because it was vague. A vague standard, something that's too changeable, that can be redefined, can be malleable after the fact, allows for the arbitrary exercise of power. And that would be dangerous to give that power to the legislature as a power to impeach the executive. And similarly, and it relates again to the impeachment clause, one of the greatest dangers from having changeable standards that existed in the English system was bills of attainder. Under a bill of attainder, the parliament could pass a specific law saying that a specific person had done something unlawful, they were being attainted, even though it wasn't unlawful before that. And the framers rejected that entire concept. In Article 1, Section 9, they eliminated both bills of attainder and all ex post facto laws for criminal penalties at the federal level, and they also included a provision to prohibit states from using bills of attainder. 
Now, in the English system, there was a, a relationship to some extent between impeachment and bills of attainder because both were tools of the parliament to get at officials in the government. You could impeach them for an established offense or you could pass a, a bill of attainder. And it was because the definition of impeachment was being narrowed that George Mason at the debate suggested. And he pointed out, in the English system, there's a bill of attainder. It's been a great, useful tool for the government. But we're eliminating that, and now we're getting a narrow definition of impeachment. We ought to expand it to include maladministration. And Madison said no, and the framers agreed. We have to have enumerated and defined offenses, not a vague concept, not something that can be blurry and interpreted after the fact, and it could be used essentially to make policy differences or other differences like that the subject of impeachment. All of the steps that the framers took in the way they approached the impeachment clause were in terms of narrowing, restricting, constraining, enumerating offenses and not a vague and malleable approach as there had been in the English system. And I think the minority views of um, Republican members of the House Judiciary Committee at the time of the Nixon impeachment inquiry summed this up and reflected it well because they explained, and I'm quoting from the minority views in the report, the whole tenor of the framers' discussions, the whole purpose of their many careful departures from English impeachment practice was in the direction of limits and of standards. An impeachment power exercised without extrinsic and objective standards would be tantamount to the use of bills of attainder and ex post facto laws, which are expressly forbidden by the Constitution and are contrary to the American spirit of justice. And what we see in the House managers' charges and their definition of abuse of power is exactly antithetical to the framers' approach because their very premise for their abuse of power charge is that it is entirely based on subjective motive, not objective standards, not predefined offenses, but the president can do something that is perfectly lawful, perfectly within his authority, but if the real reason, as Professor Dershowitz pointed out, that's the language from their report, the reason in the president's mind is something that they ferret out and decide is wrong, that becomes impeachable. And that's, exact, that's not a standard at all. It ends up being infinitely malleable. And it's something that I think, a telling factor that reflects how malleable it is and how dangerous it is, is in the House Judiciary Committee's report. Because after they define their concept of abuse of power, and they say that it involves your exercising government power for personal interest and not the national interest, and it depends on your subjective motives, they realize that that's infinitely malleable. There's not really a clear standard there. And it's violating a fundamental premise of the American system of justice that you have to have notice of what is wrong. You have to have notice of an offense. And this is something that Professor Dershowitz pointed out last night. There has to be a defined offense in advance. And the way they try to resolve this is to say, well, in addition to our definition, High crimes and misdemeanors involve conduct that is recognizably wrong to a reasonable person. And that's their kind of add-on to deal with the fact that they have an unconstitutionally vague standard. They don't have a standard that really defines a specific offense. They don't have a standard that really defines in coherent terms that are going to be identifiable what the offenses are. So they just add on, and it's got to be recognizably wrong. And they say that they're doing this to resolve a tension, they call it, within the Constitution. Because they point out, and this is quoting from the report, the structure of the Constitution, including its prohibition on bills of attainder and the ex post facto clause, implies that impeachable offenses should not come as a surprise. And that's exactly what Professor Dershowitz pointed out. And everything about the terms of the Constitution, speaking of an offense and a conviction, that it's all crimes should be tried by jury except impeachments. They all talk about impeachment in those criminal offense terms. But the tension here isn't within the Constitution. It's between the House manager's definition 
which lacks any coherent definition of an offense that would catch people by surprise, and the Constitution. That's the tension that they're trying to resolve is between their malleable standard that actually states no clear offense and the Constitution and the principles of justice embodied in the Constitution that require some clear offense. So I wanted to point that out in relation to the standards for impeachable offenses because it's a, another piece of the constitutional puzzle that fits in with the exposition that Professor Dershowitz set out. And it also shows an inherent flaw in the House manager's theory of abuse of power, regardless of whether or not one accepts the view that an impeachable offense has to be a crime, a defined crime. There is still the flaw in their definition of abuse of power that it is so malleable based on purely subjective standards, that it does not provide any cognizable notice of an offense. It is so malleable, it in effect recreates the offense of maladministration that the framers expressly rejected, as Professor Dershowitz explained. The second point that I wanted to make is that how do we tell under the house manager's standard, what an illicit motive is, when there's an illicit motive. How are we supposed to get the proof of what's inside the president's head? Because of course, motive is inherently difficult to prove where you're talking about, as they've conceded, they're talking about perfectly lawful actions on their face within the constitutional authority of the president, but they wanna make it impeachable if it's just the wrong idea inside the president's head. And they explain in the House Judiciary Committee report that the way we'll tell if the president had the wrong motive is we'll compare what he did to what staffers in the executive branch said he ought to do. So they say, quote, that the president, quote, disregarded United States foreign policy towards Ukraine, end quote, and that he ignored, quote, unquote, official policy that he had been briefed on, and that he, quote, ignored, defied, and confounded every agency within the executive branch, end quote. That is not a constitutionally coherent statement. The president cannot defy agencies within the executive branch. Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution vests all of the executive power in a president of the United States. He alone is an entire branch of government. He sets policy for the executive branch. He's given vast power. And of course, within limits set by laws passed by Congress, and within limits set by spending priorities, spending laws passed by Congress, he, within those constraints, sets the policies of the government. And in areas of foreign affairs, military affairs, national security, which is what we're dealing with in this case, foreign affairs, head of state communications. He has vast powers, as Professor Dershowitz explained, for over two centuries, the president has been regarded as the sole organ of the nation in foreign affairs. So the idea that we're going to find out when the president had the wrong subjective motives by comparing what he did to the recommendations of some interagency consensus among staffers is fundamentally anti-constitutional. It inverts the constitutional structure. And it's also fundamentally anti-democratic because our system is rather unique in the amount of power that it gives to the president. The executive here has more, much more power than in a parliamentary system. But part of the reason that the president can have that power is that he is directly democratically accountable to the people. There is an election every four years to ensure that the president stays democratically accountable to the people. But those staffers in these supposed interagency who have their meetings and make recommendations to the president are not accountable to the people. There is no democratic legitimacy or accountability to their decisions or recommendations. And that is why it is the president as head of the executive branch who has the authority to actually set policies and make determinations, regardless of what the staffers may recommend. 
They're there to provide information and recommendations, not to set policy. So the idea that we're going to start impeaching presidents by deciding that they have illicit motives if we can show that they disagreed with some interagency consensus is fundamentally contrary to the Constitution and fundamentally anti-democratic. So those were the two observations I wanted to add to supplement specific points on Professor Dershowitz's comments from last night. Now I want to shift gears and respond to a couple of points that the House managers have brought up that are really completely extraneous to this proceeding. They involve matters that are not charged in the Articles of Impeachment. They do not direct, relate, direct, relate, di excuse me, relate directly to the President or his actions. But they are accusations that were brought up somewhat recklessly in any event, and we cannot close without some response to them. And the first has to do with the idea that somehow the White House and, and White House lawyers were involved in some sort of cover-up related to the transcript of the July 25th call because it was stored on a, a highly classified system. So let me start with that. The House managers made this accusation there was something nefarious going on. But let's see what the witnesses actually had to say. Lieutenant Col Colonel Alexander Vindman, and remember, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is the person who was listening in on the call and who raised a concern, the only person who went and raised a concern with NSC lawyers that he, saw, he thought there was something improper, something wrong with the call. Even though he later conceded under cross-examination it was really a policy concern, but he thought there was something wrong. And he had to say that he did not think, he said, so I do not think there was malicious intent or anything of that nature to cover anything up. He's the one who went and talked to the lawyers. He's the one whose complaint spurred the idea that, wait, there might be something that's really sensitive here. We should make sure that this is not going to leak. He thought there was nothing covering it up. His boss, Senior Director Tim Morrison, had similar testimony. So to the best of your knowledge, there's no malicious intent in, in moving the transcript to the compartment and server? Correct. And the idea that there was some sort of cover-up is further destroyed by the simple fact that everyone who as part of their jobs needed access to that transcript still had access to it, including Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Right? So the person who raises a complaint still has access to the transcript the entire time. And this is the way uh, Mr. Morrison's testimony explained that. And, and even on the code word server, you had access to it? Yes. Um, so, so at no point in time during the course of your official duties were you, were you denied uh, access to this information? Correct. Is that correct? Um, and to your knowledge, anybody on the NSC staff that needed access to the transcript for their official duties uh, always was able to, to access it, correct? People that had a need to know and a need to access it. Once it was moved to the compartment system? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, as Mr. Morrison testified, he'd recommended restricting access to the transcript, not because he had any concern that there was anything improper or illegal, but he was concerned about a potential leak. And as he put it, how that, quote, would play out in Washington's polarized environment, end quote, and would quote, affect the bipartisan support our Ukrainian partners currently experience in Congress. And he was right to be concerned potentially about leaks because the Trump administration has fast faced national security leaks at an alarming rate. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman himself said that concerns about leaks seemed justified and it was not unusual that something would be put in a more restric restricted circulation. Now, what else is in the record evidence? Mr. Morrison explained his understanding of how the transcript ended up on that server. I spoke with the NSC Executive Secretariat staff, asked them why, and they uh, did their research and they informed me it had been moved to the higher classification system at the direction of um, John Eisenberg, whom I then asked why? I mean, that's, if that was the judgment he made, that's not necessarily mine to question, but I didn't understand it. And he, he essentially told me, I, I gave no such direction. 
he did his own inquiry and he represented back to me that it was his understanding was that it was a kind of administrative error that when he also gave direction to restrict access, the executive secretary of staff understood that as uh, a, a, an apprehension that there was something um, in the content of the MemCon that could not exist on the lower classification system. Um, so to the best of your knowledge, there's no malicious intent in, in moving the transcript to the compartment and server? Correct. Everyone who knew something about it and who testified agreed there was no malicious intent. The call was still available to everyone who needed it as part of their job. And it certainly wasn't covered up or deep sixed in some way. The president declassified it and made it public. So why were we even here talking about these accusations about a cover up when it's a transcript that was preserved and made public is somewhat absurd. Now the other point I'd like to turn to Another accusation from the House managers is that the whistleblower complaint, when the whistleblower complaint was not forwarded to Congress, they've said that lawyers at the Department of Justice this time, they accuse OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, of providing a bogus opinion for why the Director of National Intelligence did not have to advance uh, the whistleblower's complaint to Congress. And Manager Jeffries said that OLC opined, quote, without any reasonable basis that the acting DNI did not have to turn over the complaint to Congress, end quote. And the way he portrayed this, now there's a statute that says if the I, Inspector General of the Intelligence Community finds a matter of urgent concern, it must be, it must be forwarded to Congress. And Manager Jeffries portrayed this as if the only thing to decide was were these claims urgent. He said, quote, what could be more urgent than a sitting president's trying to cheat in an American election by soliciting foreign interference? That's not the only question. The statute doesn't just say if it's urgent, you have to forward it. It talks about urgent concern as a defined term. Now, if the House managers want to come and cast accusations at the p political and career officials at the Office of Legal Counsel, which we all know is a very respected office of the Department of Justice, provides opinions for the executive branch on what governing law is, they should come backed up with analysis. So let's look at what the law actually says. And I think we have the slide of that. Urgent concern is defined as a serious or flagrant problem, abuse, violation of law relating to the funding administration or operation of an intelligence activity within the responsibility and authority of the Director of National Intelligence involving classified information. So the Office of Legal Counsel was consulted by the General Counsel at the DNI's office and they looked at this definition and they did an analysis and they determined that the alleged misconduct is not an urgent concern within the meaning of the statute. Because they're not just talking about do we think it's urgent, do we think it's important? No, they're analyzing the law. And they looked at the terms of the statute. The alleged misconduct is not an urgent concern within the meaning of the statute because it does not concern the funding, administration, or operation of an intelligence activity under the authority of the DNI. Remember, what we're talking about here is a head of state communication between the President of the United States and another head of state. This isn't some CIA operation overseas. This isn't the NSA doing something. This isn't any intelligence activity going on within the intelligence community under the supervision of the DNI. It's the head of the executive branch exercising his constitutional authority engaging in foreign relations with a foreign head of state. So in reaching that conclusion, the Office of Legal Counsel looked at the statute, the case law, the legislative history, and it concluded that this phrase of urgent concern includes matters relating to intelligence activities subject to the DNI's supervision, but it does not include 
allegations of wrongdoing arising outside of any intelligence activity or outside the intelligence community itself, and that makes sense. This statute was meant to provide for an ability of the Inspector General of the intelligence community, overseeing the activities of the intelligence community, to receive reports about what was going on at intelligence agencies, those that are members of the intelligence community, if there was fraud, waste, abuse, something unlawful in those activities. It was not meant to create an inspector general of the presidency, an inspector general of the Oval Office, to purport to determine whether the president, in exercising his constitutional authorities, had done something that should be reported. This law is narrow, and it does not cover every alleged violation of law, we'll see explained, or other abuse that comes to the attention of a member of the intelligence community. Just because you're in the intelligence community and happen to see something else, doesn't make this law apply. And the law does not make the Inspector General for the intelligence community responsible for investigating and reporting on allegations that do not involve intelligence activities or the intelligence community. Now, nonetheless, the President, of course, released the July 25th call transcript. And it was also not the end of the matter that the whistleblower complaint and the, the, DNI, uh, the ICIG's letter were not sent directly to Congress, because OLC explained that if the complaint does not involve an urgent concern, but if there's anything else there that you want to have checked out, the appropriate action is to refer the matter to the Department of Justice. And that's what the DNI's office did. They sent the ICIG's letter with the complaint to the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice looked at it. And this was all made public some time ago. The Department of Justice examined the exact allegations of the whistleblower and the exact framing and concern raised by the Inspector General, which had to do with a potential of perhaps a campaign finance law violation. DOJ looked at it, looked at the statutes, analyzed it, and determined there was no violation, and it closed the matter. And it announced that months ago. All right, when something gets sent over to the Department of Justice to examine, you can't call that a cover-up. Everything here was done correctly. The lawyers analyzed the law. The complaint was sent to the appropriate person for review. It was not within the statute that required transmission to Congress. And everything was handled entirely properly. So again, actually extraneous to the matters before you, there's nothing about these, these two points in the articles of impeachment, but it merits a response when reckless allegations are made against those at the White House and at the Department of Justice. And with that, Mr. Chief Justice, I'll yield back my time to Mr. Sekulow. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers, members of the Senate. What we are involved in here, as we conclude, is perhaps the most solemn of duties under our constitutional framework. The trial of the leader of the free world and the duly elected president of the United States. It is not a game of leaks and unsourced manuscripts. That's politics, unfortunately, and Hamilton put impeachment in the hands of this body, the Senate, precisely and specifically to be above that fray. This is the greatest deliberative body on earth. In our presentation so far, you've now heard from legal scholars from a variety of schools of thought, from a variety of political backgrounds. But they do have a common theme with a dire warning, danger, danger, danger. To lower the bar of impeachment, 
based on these articles of impeachment would impact the functioning of our constitutional republic and the framework of that constitution for generations. I ask you um, to put yourself in, quoting um, Mr. Schiff's, Manager Schiff's statement his father made about putting yourselves in the shoes of someone else, and I, I said, I'd like you to put your shoes, your, yourself in the shoes of the president. And I think it's important as we conclude today that we're reminded of that fact. The president of the United States, before he was the president, was under an investigation. It was called Crossfire Hurricane. It was an investigation led by the FBI the Federal Bureau of Investigation. James Comey eventually told the President a little bit about the investigation and referenced the Steele dossier. James Comey, the then director of the FBI, said it was salacious and unverified. So salacious and unverified that they used it as a basis to obtain FISA warrants. Members, managers here, managers at this table right here, said that any discussions on the abuse from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act utilized to get the FISA warrants from the court were conspiracy theories. I told you at the very beginning, I asked, do you put yourselves in the shoes of not just this president, of any president? that would have been under this type of attack. <clears throat> FISA warrants issued on people affiliated with his campaign, American citizens affiliated with people of his campaign, citizens of the United States being surveilled pursuant to an order that has now been acknowledged by the very court that issued the order that it was based on a fraudulent presentation. In fact, evidence specifically changed. Changed by the very FBI lawyer who was in charge of this. Changed to such an extent that the Foreign Surveillance Intelligence Court, as I said earlier, I'm not going to repeat it again, issued two orders saying that when this agent, this lawyer, made these misrepresentations to the National Security Division, they also made a misrepresentation to a federal court, the federal court, the Foreign Surveillance Court, a court where there are no defense witnesses. A court where there are, is no cross-examination. It's a court based on trust. That trust was violated. And then the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, James Comey, decides he will leak a memo of a conversation he had with the President of the United States and he is leaking the memo for a purpose, he said, to obtain the appointment of a special counsel. And lo and behold, a special counsel was appointed. And it just so happens that that FBI agent, lawyer, who committed the fraud on the FISA court became a lawyer for the Mueller investigation only to be removed because of political animus and bias found by the Inspector General. Then we have a special counsel investigation. Lisa Page, Agent Strzok, I'm not going to go into the details. You know them. They're not in controversy, they're uncontroverted. The facts are clear. 
But does it bother your sense of justice even a little bit? Even a little bit? That Bob Mueller allowed the evidence on the phones of those agents to be wiped clean while there was an investigation going on by the Inspector General. Now, if you did it, if you did it, Manager Schiff, if you did it, Manager Jeffries, if I did that, destroyed evidence, if anyone in this chamber did this, we'd be in serious trouble. Their serious trouble is they get fired. Bob Mueller's explanation for it is, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I can't recall the conversations. You can't view this case in a vacuum. You are being asked, and I say this with the utmost respect, you are being asked to remove an elected, duly elected president of the United States